Hello and welcome to the third in our series of podcasts on medical statistics. In the first we considered formulating clinical questions. Last time we looked at descriptive statistics, standardised scores and the normal distribution and this week we're going to go on to look at hypothesis testing. So I'm going to introduce hypothesis testing by way of an example and I have to say it's quite a contrived one. Imagine if you will that you're um, at a school reunion and you meet up with one of your old school friends. Uh, you mention that you're working in medicine now and they begin to tell you because they think you're interested that they have developed a wonder food supplement which they think lowers cardiovascular risk by lowering, lowering sodium levels. They've called it SodiBind and they've set up a website for it. Anyone anywhere in the world can put their PayPal account details in and then have um, a box of SodiBind delivered to their door. From what you can tell, its main components are mashed up lemongrass and beetroot. Uh, so, not convinced that SodiBind really does what it says on the box, your scientific mind clicks in and you wonder if there's any way that you could test your friend's claim that it does, in fact, lower sodium. Now, given that you know a bit about formulating clinical questions, uh, you come up with a clinical question in your mind. So the population that you're interested in are healthy individuals. The intervention is taking SodiBind. The comparator group are those who are not taking SodiBind. And the outcome that you're interested in, interested in is whether the serum sodium levels are lower um, in the intervention group. Having formulated your clinical question, you go on to formulate a research hypothesis. And giving your friend the benefit of the doubt, uh, your hypothesis will be that taking SodiBind lowers serum sodium levels. The question is, how do we now test this hypothesis? So let's think about two distributions. The first is the distribution of sodium levels in healthy individuals not taking SodiBind. So that's just um, healthy people from the general population. And then the second distribution is the distribution of sodium, level, sodium levels in those taking SodiBind. Now, if we could work out both of those distributions, um, then we'd be able to get our answer. All we need to do is look at the two distributions and see whether the SodiBind distribution is lower than the distribution for the normal or the general population. And one way that we could do that would be to use a measure of central tendency like the mean. So if the blue distribution here was the SodiBind distribution, the gray distribution was the general population, then we'd have our answer, it looks like SodiBind works. But uh, we've got a problem. So whilst our friend has sold lots of SodiBind, uh, much of it has been shipped all over the world, and what's more, he's quite tight on his information governance and isn't willing to give you the names or addresses of his customers. Um, so there's no way we can really test what their sodium level is. However, he is willing to give you a blood sample um, so that we can see what his sodium level is. So we can't find out what the entire population of people taking SodiBind's sodium looks like. In fact, we've only got one sample, which is from our friend. So we can't find out that blue distribution. We don't know where it is. We do know what the distribution of sodium levels in the general healthy population is, though. It's uh, distributed normally. Its mean is 140 millimoles per litre, and the standard deviation is 3 millimoles per litre. So, we can't test our research hypothesis. We don't have enough data to do that. So we have to find some other hypothesis that we can test. And that brings us to the null hypothesis. This is a, a hypothesis which generally takes the, the default position, the status quo, if you will. So in our case, the null hypothesis, and it's often abbreviated as capital H subscript zero, as you can see there, would be that the distribution of sodium levels in the general healthy population is the same as the distribution of sodium levels, sodium levels in those taking SodiBind. So what we have to do now is uh, find out what our friend's sodium level is and see whether it looks like it's reasonable that it comes from the distribution of the general population. And we know how to do this. We can use standard scores. So, 
Here is a representation of the distribution of sodium levels in the general population. It's a normal curve. I've marked on the mean, which lies at 140 millimoles per litre, and those vertical lines each represent half a standard deviation. So let's suppose that we measure our friend's sodium level, and it comes out to be 137 millimoles per litre. Let's ask ourselves, what, what's the probability of an individual from the general population having a lower sodium level than 137? So we know that 137 is 3 below the mean, so that's one standard deviation below the mean. So it would have a, a standardized score, or a Z score, of minus 1. And we know, or if we didn't, we could look it up, that 15.9% of um, our normal population would have a sodium of 137 or lower. We call that um, a p-value of 0.159, which is just 15.9% as a decimal. So if we assume our null hypothesis to be true, that is that the, the distribution of those taking sodium bind is the same as the distribution of the general population, um, then 15.9% of the general population would have a lower serum sodium level than that of our friend. So does that support our null hypothesis? Or have we convinced ourselves that Soli bind in fact does make a difference and that we could reject the null hypothesis? Well, everyone's different, but uh, from my point of view, the fact that nearly 16% of the normal population have a lower sodium level than our friends doesn't convince me that Soli bind has made a difference. And so in this situation, I would accept the null hypothesis that both of those distributions are in fact the same. Let's suppose instead that our friend's serum sodium level turns out to be 131. Let's go through the same kind of thinking again. So 131 is three standard deviations below the mean. So that means it's got a standardized score or a Z score of minus three. Again, we could look at what percentage of the, of the population would have a sodium lower than that, and it would work out to be 0.1%. So if we assume that the null hypothesis is true, then the probability of, of somebody from the, the normal population um, having a sodium lower than our friends is 0.001, or a p-value of 0.001. So what do we think about the null hypothesis in this situation? Is it still reasonable to assume that our friend's sodium level comes from the same distribution as the general population? Um, or do we reject the null hypothesis in this case? And again, uh, some people might come up with different answers here, but I think given that our friend's sodium level is so extreme um, that only 0.1% of the general population would have a sodium level that low or lower, then it might well be reasonable to reject the null hypothesis in this case. Um, and say that Soli bind really does make a difference. So in our first example we decided not to reject the null hypothesis because nearly 16% of the general population would have a sodium level as low or lower than our friend's level of 137. Whereas in the second example uh, we decided that we would reject the null hypothesis and say that Soli bind makes a difference because were the null hypothesis true then only 0.1% of the population um, would have a level as low as the level that we measured in our friend. And the question arises, where do you put the cutoff? At what percentage or what p-value um, do you say that you're going to reject the null hypothesis? There's not necessarily a right answer here, um, but convention dictates uh, that we generally choose a p-value of 0.05. Um, that is to say, um, we reject the null hypothesis if when we assume the null hypothesis to be true, uh, we would get a value as extreme or more extreme than what we've measured in 5% of the time. So let's think about the, the process that we've gone through. The first thing we did was to come up with um, a good clinical question. And from that, we worked out a research hypothesis in our case that the sodibine distribution was lower than that of the general population. Now, if we were able to uh, know what both of those populations or both of those distributions are, then we have our answer. We just need to compare them. However, if we don't know what one of the distributions is, but do know what the other distribution is, 
then we can proceed anyway. And the next thing we did was to set up our null hypothesis, which says that both of the distributions are the same. Next, we worked out some descriptive statistic about the unknown population, um, and we asked the question, what's the likelihood of getting this statistic if we presume the null hypothesis is true? And then we said, if this probability turns out to be less than 0 0.05, then we would reject the null hypothesis. Now, it might have occurred to you as we went through this that it's quite possible that we come up with the wrong answer. So we measure our friend sodium and decide that actually it's quite high and we're going to keep the null hypothesis and say that sodium bind makes no difference. Whereas it might be that if we were able to measure the sodium levels in everybody taking sodium bind, then it really does make a difference. And the same is true. We could um, measure our friend's sodium level as being low and reject the null hypothesis when actually we should have kept it. Now this is uh, just part of the uncertainty that we have to live with when we're carrying out experiments in the real world. There are different types of errors and there are different ways of quantifying them. Next time, we're going to think some more about hypothesis testing and also about sampling. If we've got time, then we're going to think about different types of errors and also power.